it's really um, it's wonderful to see so many people here. I know we have uh, students from Bristol Agricultural High School, right? right? Over here in the front row, and we have many of our students from Bristol Community College and our the teachers from uh, high school and from here, and people are still coming in. So this is wonderful. Um, this is the third of the program for this semester, which is being presented by the Bristol Holocaust and Genocide Center. Um, and uh, as I say, I'm really, my name is uh, Ron Weisberger. I'm the director of the center, and I'm so pleased to see so many people. You are in for a memorable experience. We had, yesterday, we, uh, Dr. Oster spoke to 700 students and staff at um, Conley High School, high schools from all over the area. And uh, so you're, we're very lucky to have him again. Anyway, before I, we begin, I want to welcome Dean Kathleen Pearl, who's going to bring greetings from the college. Hello. How is everybody doing? Good, good. On behalf of Bristol Community College and on behalf of our president, President Douglas, who can't be here today, I would like to welcome you to this event. And I'd like to talk a little bit, I'm not gonna bore you, I hope, but I'm gonna just talk a little bit about what's happened in the last four years since I joined uh, Bristol as a dean. And I want to let you know about the scope of the work that Ron Weisberger and the Holocaust Center has done since I've been here. Um, we've had a, a, a large number of prominent speakers, prominent Holocaust scholars, uh, survivors. We've had the privilege of meeting some survivors. Uh, we've run workshops with teaching resources for classroom instruction. Um, we've also, through uh, Echoes and Reflections, received a lot of material on how to teach the Holocaust. So that's been um, a, a very big addition to what we do. We obviously, you know this, we do outreach to high school students, because I see some big crowd of you here today. Um, and we have a collection of books and posters and artifacts, so we're, which is growing all the time. People are often donating. Our events also involve uh, art and music and theater and literature, uh, revolving around the Holocaust and, ge and genocide. We have a comprehensive uh, global and historical perspective, and I'll give you a few examples. In 2016, we uh, ran a conference on the Cambodian genocide. Uh, on 2016, we also presented, uh, offered a lecture on gypsies and their fate in the Holocaust. In 2017, we had a conference on Native American genocide. And in 2017, we also offered uh, a, a program on euthanasia uh, euthanasia meaning, meaning pleasant death, if that can mean pleasant death. And on the T4 program, which was developed in Germany as a kind of systematic way to categorize people who, weren't, who had lives that were not worth living and to exterminate them. And that happened among the uh, mentally uh, challenged and uh, physically challenged and um, uh, the epileptics, uh, a whole range of people that the Nazis wanted to get rid of and did, uh, categorized as subhuman. In this spring, in 2019, we'll be having a conference on women in Nazi Germany and what kind of a role they played in terms of the rollout of this uh, regime. We have a good uh, input from the community, the um, New Bedford Jewish Federation, and many individual donors help us to put on the programs that we do. And I want to say one last thing. In all of the activities that I've looked at this four years that I've been here, um, I see a, a kind of overarching theme, and the theme is strength in what remains. And I didn't make this theme up. I stole it from the title of a book by Tracy Kidder, 
who wrote on the genocide that happened in Burundi. And it's a wonderful book. It's a very good book. So what does strength and what remains mean? For me, um, I look at it in three ways. I look at the resilience of people who've survived uh, horrible events. I look at um, moments of restorative justice where groups after the fact, after a genocide, after the Holocaust, have tried to come together and piece together a life um, in some cases that involve the perpetrators and the survivors, as happened in Liberia, for example. And finally, um, strength in what survives to me means educating for awareness, and that's where you all come in because it's important to be aware and to carry on the memory and the, the, the current reality of uh, genocidal initiatives that are even going on today. So with that pleasant uh, sentence, I'm going to welcome you again and thank you very much. I'm really glad to see that you're here. Thank you, Dean Pirro. <coughs> um, yeah, we, we are living in some interesting times, and this type of presentation uh, is so important, as uh, Dean said, in terms of having all of us be educated about what can happen when, when bad things start to develop. Uh, before the program begins, I just want to um, thank a few people, as I usually do, um, because these things never happen alone, right? So first of all, our center has an advisory committee which provides an important source of support for our programs. I won't name them all, but they're very important. We have, by the way, we have a Facebook and we also have a, um, um, the, the other thing. What's the other thing that people do? Uh, thank you. <laughs> uh, those, those things on social media. <laughs> so we're all on there and you can, and all our programs will be, um, will be connected to our, uh, our website. That's what I was trying, our website, which is connected to the colleges. So you can hear these speeches again, not just one, but all the numbers that we have done over the years. Um, also, I wanna thank a uh, woman who is behind the desk there, Linnell Dean, who's my assistant, who does all the logistics, couldn't do that without her. We have volunteers who have helped uh, Judy and Gary Brown, who are in here. We have Heidi Cipriano, who's in, on our student senate, and Asher Shudrick. So they, these are our, um, uh, some of our advisors. We have, I mean, our um, volunteers. Did I say advisor? Volunteers. And um, we have other folks uh, as well who help us. We want to, um, I want to thank Sean Elliott, who's doing a lot of the technical work for the sound, and um, Keith Tebow and his staff, who is taping. So we have, we have great technical assistance at this college. Um, I would thank also to the Jewish Federation of New Bedford, uh, which helps to fund us, and the Holocaust Education Committee of, that, of the Federation, which we work very closely to. Cindy Yochum is here, she's a co-chair. Um, and um, also, of course, the support of the college with the assistance of the Bristol College Foundation. All the money that we get goes through our foundation, and that really helps us a lot. So there's a lot of people to thank. Uh, finally, I want to thank Odette Amarello and Gil Mendelson, who are responsible for bringing Dr. Oster here. Um, I try to find, I try to get programming, and some I find it online. Uh, Gil Mendelson came and said, "I know someone who you need to bring," and by all means, we needed to bring him. And I want to introduce. Gil Mendelson, who will introduce our main speaker. Thank you. Good afternoon. I would like to introduce to you my good friend, Dr. Henry Oster. By the way, he's celebrating his 90th birthday this week. <laughs> Henry, as a young boy, witnessed and experienced horrible events in Cologne, Germany, and subsequently 
the concentration camps. Today, his story is more important than ever. Here is my friend, Dr. Henry Oster. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. First of all, may I thank you for attending. I am sure there are many different reasons that you came to hear the history that I experienced. I'm sure that uh, you know basically the term Holocaust. And I've always wondered when people are interested, curious to come to hear me as a survivor, not as a person, what I can possibly do to supplement the knowledge that you're seeking. It's not always easy to talk about it, but I have been doing it for almost, well, over 50 years, always hoping that it will perhaps influence your life, and mostly with hope for tolerance to one another, and that makes everything that I have to say worthwhile to share with you. I am uh, a bit of a, an oddity in that of many, many survivors that were able to come to this country, the majority shared not much of that story because, because of language, vocabulary, the pain that it takes to remind and recall things. But I find it worthwhile every time I see an audience like yourself. I know it's a corny thing to say that everybody is a great audience. But I am appreciative of the fact that I was invited to come to Bristol Community College. My friend and teacher um, made it possible. Ms. Amorello uh, invited me only because she heard from Gil that I'm around and willing to speak. This is a specially uh, odd week in itself. Tomorrow is the 80th anniversary of the Night of Broken Glass, or the German called it Crystal Night. And that made it even more significant for me to make the trip from California with my wife, Susie. And it is a uh, possible reminder and nowadays of what we experience in this country, perhaps to listen of what happened many years ago. I was born in 1928, and uh, believe me, there was such a year, <laughs> in the city of Cologne in Germany. To be a German Jewish survivor, never mind and still being around, was at scare an unusual mechanically, myth myth shall we say, mathematical probability because Germans were not interested to let Jewish children from Germany survive if they could help it. I was born in the city of Cologne, and the city of Cologne itself is an interesting city, because in Roman times, at the time of Jesus, Jews were forced to leave German, uh, uh, the, the, the Roman Empire, and the, the Roman Empire had an area adjacent somewhere in Europe that they called Germania. And for some reason or another unknown, the Jewish people that left the Roman Empire founded a colony in that area. And the name Colony or Cologne exists to this day. It was a city that was basically quite friendly to Jews, more so than other cities in Germany. And my family had settled there for well over 180 years. I'm an only child. My father was a director of a department store. My mom was a housewife, which in those days, ladies, was more than a full-time job because there were none of the conveniences that we know today. But I was a pretty happy kid. As an only child, I was curious, naughty, had a special nickname, Naughty Little Henry, and it was a life that I expected to be like all the other children in Germany, regardless whether you were Jewish or not. The first day in school was in 1934. And as all children normally anticipate, curiosity, anxiety, uh, whatever feeling they had, a little fear maybe away from home for the first day, we received in Germany 
something that uh, cheerleaders might use, like a megaphone that you carried with great deal of pride, filled with goodies, goodies like candies, little toys, anything that make the day a little bit more palatable. The problem was the first day was also an ominous day because as we left school, we were greeted by children of slightly greater age. Big difference, they were all dressed in Hitler Youth uniforms. When Hitler came to power in 1933, the society, the civility, everything in Germany was turned upside down. But the one thing they believed is that they were superior, better than anybody else. Everybody, and, and in the most unimaginable way, was below the German mentality, the German society. And one way you could distinguish people is to put them in uniforms and put flags all over the places that you cannot even imagine, from churches to anything. So we were greeted by these children who had been indoctrinated that the children coming out of the school were to be harassed, beaten, spat on, throw things at them because they are no longer humans. They're below human beings. They're like vermin, they're like rats, and just not to be tolerated. I didn't think it was the worst thing in the world because I was not hurt, although I did see the parents of those children standing in the background with their arms folded watching what was going on, interspersed with policemen to make sure that this chaotic activity stays within reasonable bounds. That was the first experience that I was not a German child, that I was less than that. Even though the German families of being Jewish are no different than any of your religion, you're Americans. What your religious belief has nothing to do with your citizenship. That's a private thing, but we all share those who are citizens, we are Americans. That wasn't good enough in Germany. My parents calmed me down and I said it was not going to be anything like this happening Little did we know. That was the beginning of the outward showing that Jews were not to be tolerated. Germans had already from day 1933 built concentration camps. These were facilities in all, I have only used the word fairness, let's say in all accuracy, were to hold people that the Germans did not feel worthy to be in their regular society. The predominant population were, of course, Jews, predominantly Jewish males. But they were also heavily occupied by Germans who were not Jewish, that the Germans felt were not to be tolerated in their society. Obviously, resistance fighters, other religions. There were Mormons, there were Seventh-day Adventists. There were bishops of the Catholic Church who did not agree with even the church doctrine of tolerance, of keeping people in life and keeping people in a reasonable way of living, and so they had to be incarcerated. Much of the German population knew everything about it, and they were intimidated by it, and made it a very easy excuse not to be of any help to the minorities that lived in Germany and had lived there for many years. 1935 came along, without any warning, the Nuremberg Laws were declared, which were laws declaring that there are no longer any rights. All that you have studied about our civil rights, predominantly in our, most of our memory, our lack of civil rights for the African-American population of the 60s. That's one civil right, an important one, to the right to vote, need I say more, even in this, these days. But the fact was civil rights means a lot more. We were not allowed to have any property. The homes were invaded and things were taken away. No receipts with no intention of getting any return. Everybody lost their job, their occupation, their profession overnight. You went to work with an office or a clinic or anything like this, you were greeted by <coughs> Men in uniform telling you, this is no longer your business. We were no longer allowed to have 
apartments, or apartments you were allowed there, uh, 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 homes, nothing on the domicile way was allowed to be in your property. We no longer could do anything about the fact that we were Jews. When you went out, you saw signs on buildings, streetcars, buses, trains, stores, anything saying Jews are forbidden. This was not the way that you expected to live, but you had to face them. As far as I was concerned, no, it wasn't all that bad. And why? Because from 1934 to 35 was the only time I was allowed to attend school. And when you're seven years old and you're told you cannot go to school, you don't mind that too much. But little did you know that this was going to be the beginning of something that no, no one could imagine. In 1935, when this happened, my father, of course, lost his business and occupation, and you stayed home. We had a lovely apartment in a Gentile old building, which when the owner was told Jews were not allowed to remain, we had to find refuge somewhere else. And so we ended up in a one-bedroom apartment with a small kitchen occupied with eight additional people. Friends, relatives, they lost their homes. These buildings were specifically designated to remain in Jewish ownership and to make what the Germans called ghetto houses. Pack them in, cram them in, and preferably don't let them out. You had little reason to go out. From the time that we moved in, I happened to be the only child. And so I slept on a wooden bench in the kitchen and that was the closest I ever came to sleeping in a bed in 1947. The other members of the group in the home took turns which couple would use the bed in the bedroom. The rest of us, we had to make do. In 1938, things changed in the most dramatic fashion. As a matter of fact, precisely tomorrow, will be the 80th anniversary of that event, and I can promise you there will not be too many people worldwide who could be witness to that particular day. And so you can imagine that I uh, make this visit, this trip, and this presentation, for me at least, a very special one. The night of 19, uh, 1938, November 9th, we heard noises outside the small apartment. We looked out, there were a tremendous number of flames, dogs, the Germans hit everything at the, the darkness of night with dogs, and we to call complete confusion, disorientation. We looked out with an enormous number of noises we couldn't explain. It was called the Night of Broken Glass, or the German call it Crystal Night. That was the day and the night that physical abuse to the German Jews was the very, very first one organized, even though the Germans, the Nazis claimed it. Oh, it was spontaneous, really. In every major city, all the synagogues, community centers, anything remotely connected to Jewish ownership was burned was burned to the ground because the Nazi prohibited the response of the fire department not to extinguish the flames. The broken glass of the looted stores that were completely littering the site was reflecting the, the flames of the building gave the name Holocaust, which means to burn. The fact that these things happened in all over German cities was simply taken as a sign, well, you know, it's a national policy, and it's, after all, it's only Jewish property. The stores that had been left alone for the supplying the Jewish population in 1935 were the ones that were simply smashed, and the littering of all the goods were looted was just part of a funny event the German people took advantage of. The German people were surprisingly very enthusiastic and very supportive, some by fear and some by the conviction that they were better 
and they thought this was one heck of a good night to show their strength in the hatred of the German Jews. 30,000 men were arrested to be put in concentration camps. Now, when Hitler came to power in 1933, they had built the very first concentration camp outside of Munich, but by the end of the war, in Germany alone, were over 2,000 concentration camps. Concentration camps were not necessarily originally intended to be a killing field, but it turned out very quickly by overcrowding and malnutrition that whether you were Jewish or German, German national, your life expectancy was not very long. These 30,000 arrested men built additional or enlarged existing ones. My father was lucky enough not to be taken. With that particular climate to live in, you might ask yourself, for heaven's sakes, why didn't you guys leave? What are you hanging around for? There was no hanging around. You couldn't leave. You were in a police state where everybody, Jew or Gentile, was known to be where they reside, what they were doing. They could get you just like that on a moment's notice. But you had to have an exit permit, which the Germans reluctantly gave, even though at the beginning of Hitler's rise in 1933, there were 600,000 Jews in a total population of 60 million Germans. We made up a one singular percent of the population. And by 1938 and 39, perhaps, uh, many of them were somehow able to leave. And it is estimated that the total population was around 380,000. It was, as far as Germany was concerned, there must be a way to eradicate. With the original intent of putting the German children in uniforms, they were also informed that the next thing we must do, we must get rid of German Jewish children. Indeed, there were transports to England predominantly that would take children of the families who couldn't get out. They did allow the German children to leave. I had no idea why it was not chosen by my parents to be sent away, so I stayed. I had an immediate family of 19 direct family members that I knew, of which I am the only survivor with the exception of an uncle. And it was only, believe it or not, four weeks ago, my German research in the translation of my book and expanding it in German that I was given 17 other names. These people I knew by name, but I did not know they were relatives because they simply didn't share my father's or my mother's family name. So even as late as 80 years later, you find out that you lost more family members than you were aware of. But that were the conditions in 1938. No chance to leave. And unfortunately, there wasn't a country in the world, including our own, right here, that would not accept any refugees. Sounds a little bit familiar right now, I know. You hate to see repetition of your own history from years ago and have to live through it. 1939, September 1st, Germany decided to start the Second World War. Now, of course, it was World War II, but the reason I choose to say the Second World War is because it's precisely that. They started the First World War precisely 25 years earlier. Germanys were always interested in war, in conquering, and feeling superior over any other country in Europe. September 1, 1939, they started the war by invading Poland. And with the invasion of Poland, the German Nazis now had a major problem. While there may have been 380,000 Jews left in Germany, in Poland they inherited over 3 million Polish Jews. And with the German efficiency, they would find a way to eliminate and to eradicate that many people. 
So they built facilities around the major population center or major uh, cities in Poland with a singular purpose, not concentration, but extermination camps. And with pure German efficiency, when people arrived there, there was no overnight stay. You arrived and you died in manners I will describe. We managed to live till 1941 in the city of Cologne, surviving bombing raids and by my presence. Fortunately, none came too close to do harm to my family or me. And we were told that you need to be ready to be taken away to a place where you get work, clothing, decent food, some housing. It'll be all right. Just report to leave Germany. In a way, you were happy to leave Germany because we were ignorant what the trip to whatever destination might mean. And we reported like good citizens. We were put on a train, rode for about three days, were taken off, and we were faced by people who greeted us in a physical condition that's undescribable. I sometimes watch television by ch channeling around and I come across some zombies. Well, that's exactly what they look like. Hollow-eyed, malnutrition, dirty, just looking through you rather than at you. And they say, welcome to Lodz. Lodz was a ghetto in Poland, in the city of Lodz. Now, a ghetto, by German efficiency, was very easy. They took the most dilapidated part of the city, the most run-down, almost uninhabitable buildings, and they shoved into that area 160,000 Polish Jews who received us with a little bit less than kindness because we were competitive for the food that was available. And there was always a little bit of a rivalry or animosity between Polish and German Jews. They certainly, I'm sure, thought that would contribute to an earlier demise. We were given a place that was not possible to describe, but basically very simple. It was a room. There were 20,000 rooms taking care of 160,000 people. We were crammed in with 18 other people. There was no room to stretch out at night. We took turns pulling our knees up or stretching out in, in a little bit of space. We were put there in rooms that have absolutely no additional amenities. No heat, no water, no electricity. The broken windows were just too bad if you had to freeze at night, and only the proximity of body to body, changing body temperature kept you from freezing. There were no facilities like restrooms or toilets. That was not their problems. That which you had to do with the excrement actually caused the spread of disease. And hey, it didn't have to kill you. You died of, quote, natural causes. <clears throat> we were put to work. My father had to fix the, electric, the fences around the ghetto. My mom had to work on the plates that went under the military boots of German armies in a miraculous way. I was destined to work at the agriculture department. If it wasn't so tragic and the consequences, I would almost have to laugh out loud today. Agriculture department? You got to be kidding. What agriculture could you have when building next to building next to building? Oh, yes, I did see a small area between some buildings, a little grassy area, which I thought may have been the uh, a playground, an abandoned playground. And indeed, from the building to the fence of the ghetto that surrounded it was a field that I was designated with 30 other people to cultivate. A shovel, a rake, and you go to work 12 hours a day. Turn the soil, make it work, get rid of the weeds, most of which, if they were edible, you would eat. The reason you would eat anything you could find because your full and total food provision each week, every Friday afternoon, was a single loaf of bread for the whole week, period. 
no other food distribution. Unfortunately, my father did not last even five months. Came home one evening, leaned against the wall, fell asleep, not to awaken again. We worked, we were being supervised. When they talk about slave labor, it is not imaginable to the reasonable population what that meant. I had, of course, a good fortune working there. Why? Because I was given the chance to commit the great crime in the whole ghetto to steal food. These seeds that we had to plant were peas, beans, lentils, oddly enough, even corn, but mostly potatoes. We had to plant them and make sure that there would be a harvest later on in the year. I put holes into my pocket, tied my legs at the bottom, at my ankles, and my trousers, and hoped that the body surge every night would not reach that far down. And indeed, by my presence here, it never did. Had it been detected or had I walked with the rattling of the dry seeds, I would have become what the Germans facetiously called Sunday's entertainment. Sunday's entertainment usually consisted of the execution on that little grassy area between buildings where Jews were surrounded and forced to attend to exhibit the execution by hanging. Now, I worked in, on the field with two men, brothers, that I thought kind of odd. They were husky. In our kind of perception, they could have been pro football players. But they had one particular hobby and habit that occasionally on Mondays, they would come to work and hand me a slice of bread. It was like willing. Uh, el a lottery scratcher. It was just a miraculous thing which I happily shared with my mom. Of course, I didn't question why they gave it to me. I was a 13-year-old little kid, scrawny, malnutrition, and to find in addition to what I could steal a slice of bread was phenomenal. The food that I stole was not digestible because we had no facility, no heat, no cooking, no utensils. So you ate the seeds, the beans, the peas, whatever they were. You almost worked them like a chewing gum. But protein was protein. The first time I was forced to attend Sunday's entertainment, I was trotted with a bayonet to raise myself up, look above the height of the adults. The dogs that the Germans always had with them, killer dogs, over 200,000 dogs in their canine corps, all trained to be killers, all ready to attack. I raised up into my great shock and surprise. I did not believe my eyes. Who were the executioners of the ghetto? The ones who were absolutely on a weekly basis hanging the Jews, being forced to do that, but by two benefactors who gave me a slice of bread. I always thought that maybe they gave me a slice of bread to, re to reduce their sense of guilt of executing Jews because it wasn't necessarily on a voluntary basis. It took me 70 years just to mention that when people asked me to write a book. I thought I'd never write a book in my experience, but a patient of mine insisted that he and I write a book. And we were all done. He says, Henry, what do you want to call it? He says, you know, I have a problem, he said. I'm American. I'm not Jewish. You didn't live like most uh, uh, survivors a year, half a year, maybe two years. You lived your 17 years of your life in Germany, 12 under Nazi domination, and over four years in ghetto and other camps. I just cannot believe that there wasn't a single human being who ever extended to you and your family an act of kindness. I said, Dexter, that, that's routine. Well, when we finished the book, he said, now, what, what do you want to call it? I had no clue. He had no clue. But then he brought up the fact about this uh, lack of kindness 
And I said, you know, if you think about it, I have to agree that that slice of bread was about the only kindness in all the years that I experienced. And that is <laughs> why the book is called The Kindness of the Hangman. It was about two months after the book had come out that I realized and accepted in my own mind that it was a tribute uh, to two men, brutal as they were, forced as they were, kind as they were, giving the little kid a slice of bread, and that's how the, the title came to be. The atrocities, the things that went on the ghetto need not to be mentioned, but in 1944, we were told that you can bring your mom or, or any family members to be given an insignia to bring in the harvest of the little land, that, the plot of land that we brought, uh, that we were taking care of. We went and found ourselves in a trap. My mother and I were immediately put on train, covered livestock wagons, and were taken away from the ghetto of Lodge to destination unknown. The train rode for a day or so, came to a stop in the afternoon. They raised me up to the barbed wire window to find out, maybe they can read the, the Polish or German name of the city we're in. There wasn't any. All you could see was yellow wires with insulating uh, attachment on posts. The yellow was fields to be harvested. The Germans waited for one thing, the darkness of night. The train moved on a few hundred yards. The doors were ripped open. We were ripped out, torn out, bitten out, prodded out. All and we waited for the darkness to create confusion, panic, and total disorientation. We jumped off. We were immediately forcefully separated by the dogs, by guns, by bayonets. Women go on the other side. My mom was taken away, torn away, as if she, like a tornado, whoosh, she was gone. No time to say anything. The brutality of separation by force cannot be described, not even in the book. She merged into the marching column of women that was proceeding to the end of the platform and that was the last time I ever saw or heard from her. None of this was yet to be known what would come. I'm now in the middle of the adults, of male adults. We had to march. We came to the end of the railroad station. An officer stood there, looked at you for a moment. And with the swaggers, they pointed to the right or to the left. You had no way to escape. You had to follow orders. We entered a barrack, we were stripped, they shaved our hair. We were given a shower, maybe 10 seconds, and we were pushed out the other end and found myself in the clearance, sort of a courtyard. I'm pushed against a building, a gray building with an enormous smokestack and a huge flame, but an odor that we had, none of us had experienced. There were men waiting in blue and white striped uniform and saying, welcome to Auschwitz. And that was the first time I had ever heard of that city. The other half of the column entered the next, the adjacent barrack. They were stripped. They lost their hair. They were not given a shower, but they went through the shower facilities with shower heads. Instead of water, it provided poison gas. And these were the gas chambers of Auschwitz while the building I was standing against was the crematorium. Now, Auschwitz needs to be given a little explanation. There were two facilities. The arrival point by trains from all over Europe was called Birkenau. This was a facility with the gas chamber, the 90,000 um, uh, men uh, destined to be killed or to be put to work. There were the crematorium. There were many other facilities that were used by German factories. And you arrived there with no knowledge what was going to happen to you. 
about a mile and a half further away was a concentration camp, Auschwitz. Although the name encompasses all the factories, all the facilities, but there were two separate ones. One was the killing facility, and Auschwitz were those that were actually being used for slave labor. We were told that you are lucky to have survived, and it was long after the war that I found out that it is hard to believe not even one-tenth of one percent of arriving juveniles were allowed to live. You had to be 15 years, or at least look 15 years and older to have any chance, and not every one of those were allowed to live. It was at the whim of the one who made the selection. So anybody that was 15 years or younger was immediately put to death. That's why you had the largest killing of children in Auschwitz with approximately more than a million and a half people were killed in that one facility. Predominantly, the children that arrived died within the same day that they came to that place. Auschwitz has a name that meant a lot. It's probably the most famous camp. It has a distinction being in Poland with the largest number of people having to die there. The, the adults tried to be kind and said, you know, whatever you do, don't ever volunteer. We received a slice of bread and maybe every other day a bit of soup. The life expectancy was four to six, I mean, I'm sorry, six to eight weeks. I don't even recall how long I was there when one day I had to visit the latrine. A rare visit indeed when you only get a slice of bread and occasional soup. But the miraculous timing that had been so frequent in my case, uh, which I could never fully understand, was that at that particular time somebody came in and said, looking for juvenile volunteers. Now about 90,000 inhabitants in that camp, it is estimated there were not even 250 children. I not only decided to go, I ran, and in my idiocy at the time, not only did I go to volunteer, I even raised my arm and said, hey, I speak German, take me. I assumed that since almost all the others were Polish, Hungarian, Czechoslovakian, maybe speaking German would be a bonus, a benefit, an advantage. And indeed, 130, and myself were chosen. We were given a number, a tattoo, anything to debate you, demean you, or to keep you registered. We're never even sure whether they kept the name, but they did. And not that I ever recall giving it. And so we were put, tattooed with a painful arm on a truck taken to a mile and a half away the camp of Auschwitz we were put to work the following day, working in stables. We were walking there on a short distance and saw these barracks, never seeming to be a, shall we say, promising structure for survival. They shoved us in, we found ourselves in stables. Each being given the assignment to take care of several horses, which was kind of odd. But as it turned out, Germany invaded Russia with inadequate military equipment, and they used nearly two million horses to invade Russia. None of this was known to us. The one thing that shocked all of us, there were no human beings there. Who took care of these horses? How can that be? Simple. You work 12 hours a day would have been a joy. You work 16 hours a day, taking care of the horses, which were more important because all of these horses were pregnant. This was a huge horse producing facility. We had no fear during the day that something would happen because the horses were important more than human beings. But where were the people that took care of the horses before? Simple. 
They were malnutrition. They had to work that long. When you got to the point you no longer could perform, they shipped you back the mile and a half in order for you to be killed. And that was the end of your life expectancy. In January of 1945, we were forced to present ourselves to leave the camp of Auschwitz. It became what is commonly known as a death march. A death march is simple. You put a whole lot of people together, and you force them to march with a threat. If you don't keep up, you'll be executed. We use the military uh, prisoner of war marches the same way. That's why they all are here and, and obliged to follow the rules because death is waiting if you fall by the right side or behind. Not everyone survived the death march. They were put on trains. This time they were open cattle wagon, open livestock wagon. Again, the train took off to destination unknown. The very next day, we hear a noise that was sort of unfamiliar. We wondered. It became very obvious in no time at all, looking up at the sky and see two airplanes circling the train. I was quite surprised and puzzled because of all these people, there were not many who knew the German insignia or military equipment, which I did, but they didn't have that. They had circles, no crosses. And I could not understand what that was. We did not know till 1945, just five months before German lost the war, that Europe had been invaded, much less in being in Poland, in Auschwitz. We didn't know Germany was losing the war. The Allies did, and they realized that Germany was drawing, was drawing all the military force from other countries they occupied back into Germany to defend Germany itself. And the rule and the order was, don't let it happen. Flying over a train, looking down and seeing open wagons, all in blue and white striped uniforms. Allied fighter pilots could not tell friend from foe, and we were attacked by a machine gun attack two times. My good fortune was I was put into the, the railroad wagon very early and was against the front, fortunately not being in the line of fire. Consequently, we lost about one third of those that were with us. The train kept on going with the carnage, the wounded and the dying. And a few days later, we arrived up a hill. We were unloaded. I could not move. I looked like a frog, they had like two handles here. They picked me up and I was informed that I was back in Germany, just what I needed. A land that didn't want me, now I was back in the concentration camp called Buchenwald. Buchenwald was an elitist camp that held a lot of German nationals, non-Jewish, and illegally, as so nothing to it for the Germans, Russian uh, prisoners of war. And these two people, these two groups, tried desperately to keep 1,500 boys that had been collected alive. We were put in a barrack that used to be a stable in order for the law that the Germans expect not to have Jewish children survive, we were infected with typhus. Starvation took its toll. Other disease from rats, from lice. These were bunks that we slept on, and not enough for everyone to be accommodated. Somehow, many of us 926, as a matter of fact, did survive. And on April 11, after not having had food since April 1 for 10 days, where people were dying all over the place and we were too weak to move, we hear noises again that were unfamiliar, which turned out to be tanks. The fear that we had, because we told that no, no camp will be allowed to remain. It'll be flattened to the ground by tanks 
bulldozers, flamethrowers, grenades, machine guns, anything. And the fear that we had immediately that we might have 30 seconds to live. But we lifted us, I myself lifted myself up looking out a window with the little strength I had, and I was convinced I lost my sanity. I see the tank, I feel I have about 30 seconds before blast, the, being blasted out of the face of the earth, but it didn't happen. And when I looked closer, I was convinced my sanity has gone down the drain because I'm looking at a white star of David on that tank. That is not possible. But looking up at the turret was a soldier, an officer, who was yelling in Yiddish, a language most Europeans use, understand, you are free, you are free, we are here to free you. That was an American. It was uh, General Patton's Third Army, predominantly armored, that had sent up the tanks to liberate the camp. The medics of the Third Army came quickly sorting out the near dead, the dead, and the more likely to live, and we were taken into the buildings that had been vacated by the German guards. The Red Cross came in rather rapidly, trying to say that we would be given all the care they can get, which was not easy in a war zone, in an isolated camp up a hill. And the other thing that internationally caused, they took all what we call data, whatever you can give about family, birth, anything, with the hope that would possibly be able to reunite families. Not much of a chance of that. We did all that we could. Jewish organizations came quickly, waiting for us to gain strength that we might be able to transport somewhere else, and offered refuge in either Switzerland, France, and England. I decided I will never set foot on German soil. I will have to leave, and preferably not even European soil. I chose to go to France, because we were promised a ship would be leaving sooner or later from France to go to Palestine, now Israel, which would be a homeland for all the Jewish orphans, and hopefully there would be a way to make a life. Two weeks before the ship was to leave, a gentleman came to the orphanage and said, I am from the American consulate. I am here to see Henry Oster. And so I was made acquainted to this gentleman who informed me that the Red Cross had taken the names from all the survivors wherever they could find them and asked worldwide publications to list every Friday afternoon the names of the newly discovered survivors. And indeed, the uncle, who was lucky enough to leave Germany in 1938 to go to Philadelphia, had moved to Los Angeles and found my name in the Los Angeles newspapers, including the Jewish publications, which obviously made every effort to list every name. And I arrived here in 1946 one of the earliest surviving arrivals, because there was a quota system as we had then and now in immigration. And obviously, German quota was quite large, but Germans could not come unless you were Jewish. I arrived here to finish up for at least the students for, uh, uh, that are here today. I had no, I had an empty brain. I came here without the language skills. I had no information about much of what might happen except my history. I had to go to school here. Of course, I had no money, no possessions. My uncle and aunt, who had no children of their own because of the hardship they encountered living in a new country, received me better than any parents. They had a little service station during the war. And I decided I had to do something to help out to improve their lifestyle. And I insisted to take the night shift, which I did after school, which happened to be walking distance uh, from the station. 
I was selected to go to a school that gave three hours of English information, a language course, and I managed for 10 years to do so. My uncle and aunt were very kind to take somebody coming like a kid falling out of the sky, but they said, you have to do something in repayment. <laughs> um, you have to make something out of yourself. Well, with an empty brain, anything I could learn more or less got stuck. And I found myself surprisingly at the end of two and a half years graduating at the age of nearly 22, because I was almost 18 when I arrived. And I decided to follow their advice. I was surprised to find myself eligible to go to university. And I went to UCLA with the idea that I would like to become a dentist because of poor dental care or no dental care during the war. I needed frequent visits to the dentist and I liked the idea of becoming a dentist. Unfortunately, believe it or not, the only anti-Semitic experience I had since coming <laughs> in 1946 was my application to dental school. At the time, there were two in California. Berkeley was one that would be willing to accept me under the conditions I'd have to return to my homeland because I would not be allowed to practice in California because I wasn't a citizen. The other university showed the first and only sign of anti-Semitism. Of an entering class of 100, only two would be allowed to be Jewish. And I was not able to make any contribution to the, the money that they needed and was consequently not accepted. As I always say, I will not mention the name of the university, but the initials are USC. It is not, in all fairness, it is not that kind of institution any longer. As a matter of fact, it is the uh, university that houses Mr. Spielberg's Shoah Foundation, which is documenting nearly 60,000 survivors' story that you can look up on the, uh, YouTube and read my story and everybody else's. As I left the school, I discovered a school of optometry which was not connected to USC, it happened to be the adjacent building. <laughs> a friend of mine wanted to be an optometrist, his father was, and I felt, well, two generations, that must not be too bad. Oh, what the heck, why don't I take an application? I was admitted, and four weeks later, entered the school of optometry with no idea what an optometrist does. <laughs> no clue, I never needed an examination and my family was still young enough to need neither one of them. However, I practiced for 60 years, and I was very proud to be an optometrist. The idea was that I had managed to find a home, a country, that was only imaginary. Talk about a country, that's great. <laughs> I found that. I managed to do all I can to find anything that would be worthwhile doing by making certain voluntary contributions, uh, like Cedar Sinai Medical Center. And I started speaking when I was asked to speak at the Museum of Tolerance. I've been speaking there for 43 years. Now, what about Germany? I had sworn never to go back. In 2011, I received a phone call from the city of Cologne. Would I consider visiting, since they have a program all over Germany, major city, inviting survivors? I won't give you my opinion why they do it, but it was certainly <laughs> if I may say, it was sort of like kissing you behind, and that isn't going to make it any better. I rejected it. Two weeks later, I received a call from the, the mayor. He said, I would like you to consider something. 2011 is going to be the year that it'd be the 70th anniversary of the deportation of the 2011 Jews 
that you and your family were in. Only 23 survived the war. And you're the last um, living one of that 2011. Would you not consider coming? I discussed it with my wife and family, and I said, you know, I don't want to go, but I have to go. And people ask me, but Henry, 70 years you told us that. What's the one reason you go now? You have to forgive the, <laughs> the obscenity. But this was it. <laughs> Flipping the finger to the Germans and being that survivor and being able to rub it in was a hell of a motivation to make that trip. We did, my wife and Susie and I went back a second time in 2015 for the liberation of the, get, the concentration camp in Buchenwald. It was its 70th anniversary. And basically that has been the story of what I can convey to you what it means to have survived the Holocaust. We do have to consider ourselves living in a great country, not to make it great again. I think day before yesterday is going to be one of the greatest days this country has ever seen. We have a greatness in this country, but it's always been with a, and I don't mean, <laughs> sorry to say, I don't mean to politicize the speech, but I'm so proud of this country. We have seen what greatness can be in this country, but it's always been because we now have 100 or more women in Congress that never happened before. <laughs> we have now two Muslims, two Native Americans. That never happened before. Whatever it may say, I think you can realize when you listen to the news that it is something that needs to be celebrated. And I have maybe a shocking news for you, that I believe Mr. Trump, I won't call him president, Mr. Trump has actually achieved his agenda and will leave a legacy that he made it possible for the world to see <laughs> what the population of this country really can do to prove itself great. We don't have to be told to make it great again, but to me at least, this country has been the absolute greatest. And I'm very proud uh, to at least convey the idea. Thank you. Thank you. I know we um, may, some students have to go to class. Um, um, Dr. Hoster has, there are some books. You can see that he will be uh, outside. And if you're interested in, in purchasing them, and he'll autograph it, um, be happy to do that. Also, um, certainly be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Any questions? Nothing is too sensitive. Yes, please. someone who's personally been there and to hear your experience. Thank you. So I'd just like to say thank you. That's very kind of you. I'll answer any questions. Yes, please. Um, after reading your book, I was curious to find out if you had ever found out what happened to your friend. The what? You had a friend at one point. Yes. You made no friendship in most, uh, under these conditions. Everybody was only worried about making it to the next day, sometimes the next minute. But in Buchenwald, I encountered a friend who became a friend, uh, along with the more famous one, Eli Weisel, was in their camp and, and also in the orphanage with me. And my friend survived. We were oddly 
separated because he stayed behind. I tried desperately to find him here. I knew he was coming. I looked in New York everywhere, but he lived in Long Island. And after 40 years, we found each other. And he passed away the, the year the book was published, just unfortunately in time to dedicate the book to him, of course, to my family. Things are not explainable in, under these conditions. I've wondered many times why me, the incidences that I encountered and survived, I have never been able to explain. My wife Susie, of course, believes that I must have a guardian angel. Because, you know, people ask me, you know, why do you think God saved you? He, she, brown, yellow, white, did not do that. That's human beings who do that. With a feeling of justification that's very difficult to explain. It's not the only one. We have genocide, a term that was coined after the war, or no, during the war, 1944, in Rwanda and all over the world, you have atrocities where people feel anybody below them does not deserve to survive and people will slaughter each other. Half throughout history, and I'm afraid in the future as well. Hopefully not as much as it was in the past, but I mean, we just had uh, eight miles from where I live, the killing last night, and people, 13 people died. I don't know why it is that people feel the right. Now, I must, this is not planned, but I, that's how I feel. This country is based on violence. I know we like to be peaceful, but the basis is this is a country that was based on immigrants and refugees coming to this continent and slaughtering the Native Americans and feeling they had the right. We had our founding fathers, to my great surprise, writing a constitution, declaration of the independence. We, the people, who were the we? Not the Native, not the African Americans, not the hardworking farmers, special people that were educated, had property. And we had, of course, truly a country divided. When you had brother fight against brother in a civil war for the sake of slavery. Then we had a reconstruction era. What was this justice? Vigilante justice. Everybody with the pistols, and we glamorized it in the Western. It was an era that we had the founding of the largest group of terrorists almost any country had, the Ku Klux Klan. Not only that, they paraded in presidential parades, inaugural parades. We accepted it and tolerated it. Then we had, of course, the era of Prohibition, but crime and violence was glamorized with <laughs> machine gunning with the cars running through. Of course, we had radio with mystery program and television. What kind of programs do you watch, folks? All guns, collision, explosions, military. And we enjoyed that as entertainment. And the very, very worst that followed video games. Do you have tic-tac-toe when you play it? No way. The kids are all behind guns, and killing is the sport and the amusement. And you wonder why people pick up guns and execute innocent people who are dancing in an evening. And we have to live with that. The intolerance that we show to one another, we have to learn because intolerance it's pretty much part of our history, even though we are blessed and fortunate enough to have a rich country, and we have different peoples living supposedly together with different ideas except the one to live in peace. We have to learn it. Any other questions? Yes, please.
there were only Jews. There were no others. A ghetto means only Jews. No, they were born in Poland. I don't know how observant the Jews as Jews were, but there were no other. There was no, no Christian, no any other faith, no. That's what made it so difficult, perhaps, Jews executing Jews by, they would have been killed if they didn't do it. They were picked simply because they were gigantic. They could handle the people. Yes, One please. One more uh, question, and then Dr. Austin could be available with his books, and you can ask him questions that way. Go ahead. Um, I was just curious what your number was. You're welcome to see my number. I'll, I'll bring my sleeve up, and you can see that. The, the number is B7648. You will label by number in order to be categorized like, like um, branding cattle. Not, there's only Auschwitz was the only camp that did that. And to be accurate, never when you got in, never, because they never expect you to live, only when you were taken out, like I was, were you given a tattoo? It was brutal, and many people asked me, why didn't you get rid of it? And I said, I wouldn't get rid of it, because what I had to do to earn it, so to speak. And they said, well, doesn't it bother you? I say, not the least, because I survived. And I made it my license plate on my automobile <laughs> as well. The world doesn't know what it means, but I do. <laughs> yeah, okay. So thank you. Thank you very much. Anything else?